and welcome to what you've most likely accidentally stumbled upon, my Wonder Woman sequel review. Naturally, to prepare, I wore to my parents' house for Christmas my Wonder Woman rings. Check it out, y'all. These things are rad. So I was really ready when I stepped into my apartment and I turned on HBO Max. So let's get into it. Uh, I've been anticipating this from the moment I stepped out of the theater the first time I saw the first one and also tend to do things like this where I wear the tiara like it's totally normal because it is. Unfortunately, no amount of movie memorabilia could have prepared me for the letdown that I was uh, faced with when I started uh, the Wonder Woman sequel yesterday. It was... A hot mess to be um, kind um, and uh, to be completely brutally honest it was badly edited it was badly written it was badly paced and um, it was unoriginal and honestly what's worse than any of that is that the heart of what the first Wonder Woman film had was nowhere to be seen in the sequel it was lifeless it didn't feel sincere it didn't feel authentic it didn't feel heartfelt in any way it just felt like it was chasing its own shadow and it never actually became anything that was substantial enough to actually have its own shadow from this point forward i'll probably go into some spoilers to be more specific about what i didn't like about it so if you don't want to listen to that i would just stop now <laughs> but essentially um the world that was created for this movie did not feel lived in it felt like we were forced into it. Like a lot of the stuff that happens in the movie, it felt forced. If not a callback to the first movie where it tried to duplicate some of the things that Diana does or that the story does and the structure of the story does in the first one, it's a callback to the comic books, but not in a way that sets this movie up to be individual, to be its own thing. Um, I would say that um, it also made some plot uh, some plot holes um, unless there's just an easy explanation that I have missed but specifically about um, the first the opening like scene is about Diana like like competing with all of these Amazons and like and essentially what is essentially like an Olympics style Amazonian like uh, track meet uh, decathlon whatever you want to call it and her mom is there and she's like super excited Polita is like on it um but i was pretty certain that in the first movie it was clear that diana was not allowed to train and that she only did it um on the sidelines when she was a child uh because her nannies would try to teach her or she uh was able to do it only in secret with antiope and so it was a very strange thing to watch that her mom was like super cool with it and then like both her aunt and her mom used that memory that Diana's having with her voiceover um, as a way to like teach her a life lesson that a later will come back around and will help Diana in a time of need in this movie. And it felt like a really bad reason to go and like, like rewrite part of the first movie just to kind of have this line that she uses later with one of her enemies uh, have more impact when it actually didn't help the impact at all it landed flat and so they undid that for no reason most of the plot revolves around this wishing stone and that's how steve comes back and um it's kind of unclear how the stone really works uh even though they liken it to the monkey's paw which i assume many of us are uh familiar with to a degree that you wish for something and it gives you what you want but then it takes something from you um, but what I didn't understand is why when Diana wished for Steve to come back, that for whatever reason he had to come back and inhabit the body of some random stranger. He literally is inside of a random stranger's body and Diana doesn't recognize him at first because he looks like a random stranger. And then something happens, like he does this like weird, like remember the clock that I gave you and uh, remember my last few words to you. And like she like, realizes it's Steve with very little convincing, honestly. And then all of a sudden he, she can see him as Steve, but I guess no one else can because it's this other guy's body. I don't understand the magic to this very moment. And I'm talking through it again and I'm like, 
there's no good explanation for this. Why, why, why did that have to be, if they, they could have just wished him back into existence and then he was just there and alive. Like he didn't have to be some other guy who had another life and an apartment and a consciousness and a whole other thing. That was my thing is like, is he inhabiting this body now? And like, it's some kind of like weird consent agency issue. And that's another thing that was disturbing to me is that they never even considered it. Like that now Steve is here and his consciousness is taking over this body, but like whose body is it? And he's just using it the way that he wants. Like I just, it was a complication that was very unnecessary to the plot of the story because it would have made just as much sense with the magic of the stone if he had come back and it was a literal just normal weird magic thing where he's like oh i'm back again but no that's not what we got barbara's storyline was completely sidelined they started it really sweet kristen was adorable she was very cute and herself and likable and became friends with uh diana and then became hot and then she became mean and then she became a jellical cat inexplicably also even though she was already granted a wish she was granted a second wish i again don't understand how this the stone really works it seemed like you could only have one wish but she got two um and then was kind of put away like and was taken like to the side um i think the movie suffered from having too much going on but at the same time barbara's story was very important i felt because it was about how she wished for things that she wasn't necessarily to make herself better and then what i assume was supposed to happen was she was supposed to learn that the things that she had to begin with were what made her great and it never resolved the only emotional punch that the movie landed with me was when diana had to say goodbye to steve inevitably of course for the second time in her life i thought that the themes of that conversation really resonated at least with me and i knew that it would resonate with a few of my friends the idea that she's been giving and giving and never asking for anything in return and she just says let me have this one thing Diana. as beautifully as it was played by gal gadot and as beautifully as it was played by chris pine who's wonderful in every scene he's in he's a joy um her wig was messed up her wig was so obviously bad and i was like what are we doing who is in charge of these things and again i love wonder woman and i love gal gadot and i love wigs <laughs> i am pro wig Anyways, the scene was great, but it also bothered me that Diana can't seem to just be happy on her own. She needs this man in her life and it's been decades and she needed him to come back to teach her a lesson that there's life worth living outside of him. When she was fine before she met him, she was an Amazon. She's a full, she's a whole entire goddess, but she still needed this man to come and teach her that there's life after me. Okay, isn't the whole point of the first movie that she found hope and love in humanity and that's why she wanted to protect humanity? I get that a woman can be both strong and in love, but I just didn't like the idea that it seemed to focus on that she couldn't be fulfilled or whole without him, um, no matter what she did. I felt like she found her wholeness in the fact that she believed in humanity and that was like part of her whole thing and that mattered to me i didn't like that it was diminished in this way which brings me to the end of the movie where a essentially pretty badly written speech um was badly paced and badly edited over a bad guy doing an evil thing while she talks about you know being a hero in a way that mimicked the first one in a very cheesy way. I felt the Aries um, speech in the first one made sense. It came full circle. This one didn't. It felt very contrived and it was very clear what they were trying to go for and it was not successful. And the big twist reveal is that she is um, speaking to all of humanity. She's speaking to all of the citizens watching, like tuning in. <laughs> And she is telling all of them that they can save the world if they just give up their greatest wish that they wished for. And that somehow, 
hearing this badly written speech convinces every single person who made a wish to recant their wish and give their wish back something that none of civilization could do in all of human history, something that they discovered was impossible for every other civilization. And they actually were able to defeat the stone by doing this, by hearing the speech. You're telling me an American, a Texan, sitting at home on Christmas day, watching HBO Max because she was unable to really see her family for Christmas because we're in the middle of a global pandemic for the ninth month in a row because there's yahoos out here who won't even wear a cloth mask to the grocery store. You're telling me that I'm supposed to believe that Wonder Woman says that speech and every citizen on earth does what they need to do in order to help protect everyone. I know this was made before COVID, but oh my God, there's no way that message was gonna play well. There were good moments. I, I liked every performance was um, good, was delightful. Whatever was handed to these actors, they did well with, even if it was badly written. The energy was good from Pedro Pascal. I've already said how Kristen Wiig was adorable. Gal is always just the most beautiful, like race. I don't know how she, she's like truly a goddess. And Chris Pine, like I said, was great. Um, the fashion was fun. It looked beautiful and I'll always want to watch you know, the fight scenes are fun. It was just lacking in a lot of other ways. Female-led, female-centric, female-driven, and female-produced movies, projects, whatever, have a lot more pressure on them to be good because there's the idea that if it's not good, that means that girls can't do it. So I don't know. I want to kind of embrace the fact that I didn't think it was good and then also demand that we get more because there's so many male-centered superhero franchises that have been created and have been mediocre and continue to churn out sequel after sequel, reboot after reboot, and nobody really questions it or if there are questions it's not ever taken very seriously, but if, you know, if we get one bad female-centered something, it's, oh, well, then women can't do that, see? Oh, or the first one was a fluke, I guess. Like, I've already seen some takes online that, oh, well, the sequel reveals the fact that actually the first one was bad from the, from the get-go. And it's like, how does that even work? And I don't really know. But it, that is the kind of thought processes we're having to face as we also see the kind of criticism that female-led movies get. So I'm embracing the fact that this movie, in my opinion, and the opinion of many of my friends and others that I've read online, was actually pretty bad. And we also deserve more Wonder Woman. This isn't, this doesn't mean we we're done. It means we deserve more time to find our footing like so many other franchises have that have stumbled and come back and made just as wonderful follow-ups um, as the first, if not better. Many other series surpass the first one. And I feel like as wonderful as the first movie was in the series, there's so much more potential here to do even better. I was disappointed this one didn't, but I don't feel it means that we can't get there. So I don't know. That's what I feel about Wonder Woman 1984. Um, that and a lot more. But at the end of the day, I feel like we deserve more, Diana, and I hope that we get more. And I hope that we get better than this because we deserve it. And I know I've seen it. We've seen it that we can get better than this.